Hello, everyone. Welcome to the TLGS 2022 conference. My name is Mo Chakraborty from Salisbury University. I will be collecting questions in the chat for this session, which is titled, How Graduate Student Fellows Enhance What a Center for Digital Scholarship Does. Ben, all yours. Great. Thanks a lot, Mo. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Chupasa. I'm an economics and data librarian with the Naveri Family Center for Digital Scholarship, which I'll refer to as NFCDS for um, this presentation. And we're part of um, the University of Notre Dame's um, Hesburgh Libraries. And I'm here today to discuss the NFCDS Pedagogy Fellowship Program that was established last year. And we're actually in the middle of the pilot year. Um, and it's running as we speak. Um, and in short, the program is an opportunity for Notre Dame uh, PhD students to build their teaching expertise, gain instructional experience, and engage in a continued practice with a focus on digital scholarship learning opportunities. So things that include like geographical information systems, data analysis, data visualization, um, natural language processing, and, and really disciplinary uh, specific uh, computational tools. So I'm going to be uh, discussing uh, why we as a center established it, um, how we established it, and also the lessons learned that can be applied to maybe um, your current settings or contexts and available resources. So just a bit of context, the NFCDS is charged with uh, leveraging these uh, state-of-the-art technologies, and we, we try our best to kind of enable students and faculty to explore new methodologies, analyze complex data and share research results. And the aim is to transform how teaching, research, and scholarship are performed here at Notre Dame. Um, and we established a lot of um, partnerships um, campus-wide and act as a hub that enhances the uh, teaching, learning, and research process in all sorts of academic disciplines. And you can learn more about the center in this link right here, cds.library.md.edu. Um, just something to uh, keep in mind as well is that um, even though digital scholarship is embedded within our center's name, we're still you know, figuring out and agreeing upon uh, the best definition of what is this digital scholarship. And, and you can read our um, definition of it here on this slide. Um, Mackenzie and Martin in 2016's Developing Digital Scholarship Emerging Practices in Academic Libraries defines digital scholarship as the use of digital evidences, investigative methods, publication and preservation to demonstrate specialism. Um, but you know what, however we define digital scholarship, one observation is that a lot of emphasis has been placed on research outputs um, that's tied to digital scholarship. So things like websites, right? Uh, data visualizations, maps, um, how we present geospatial data. Um, however, we, we can't also forget that teaching is a big part uh, of the pie as well, a big piece of the pie. Uh, digital methods are rapidly evolving, and I would argue that it's not just about what to learn, um, but how to learn these evolving methods and tools in an effective and empowering manner. Um, so to address this instructional side of the coin, um, we at NFCS, we came up with um, this teaching oriented fellowship program that attempts to uh, address some gaps um, present in the graduate student experience that we noticed here at Notre Dame. Um, for one, if we're looking at um, uh, job our uh, market opportunities for those um, getting their PhDs and, and moving on to uh, academic roles. Uh, a well-rounded teaching portfolio is required to be competitive in that job market and, and also thinking about the quality and the quantity of teaching experiences and how um, that can vary depending on departmental priorities. You know, some departments focus a lot of their efforts maybe on research instead of teaching. Um, STEM folk um, emphasize and prioritize lab time. Um, and should a graduate student graduate without a robust uh, teaching portfolio, that might place them at a disadvantaged position. And again, that's not to say that they didn't take advantage of existing opportunities, but quite frankly, sometimes opportunities can be few and far in between, depending on just pure availability of opportunities or lack of funding. Um, long story short, um, exposure to teaching um, um, varies depending on uh, th that availability of opportunities and not all programs or departments and funding requirements and mechanisms are necessarily the same, even within a single campus. 
Um, secondly, even if a graduate student receives uh, quality training and experience in teaching within their respective programs, um, there is generally is not a lot of times pedagogical emphasis on computational data science, digital scholarship, or tech enabled methods. So for example, when um, folks teach computer programming, rather than relying on slides, a lot of folks who do this work um, rely on the approach of live participatory coding, where learners code alongside the instructor. So coding along gives learners continuous feedback uh, and practice, and also the added benefit to coding alongside the instructor is that, you know, with the learners using their own keyboard boards, running into the same mistakes that the um, instructor is, and then that opens up opportunities to troubleshoot together with the instructor. So it's a wonderful example of real world simulation. So that's just one example of the kinds of, you know, uh, pedagogy and teaching kind of um, environments that, that really don't get uh, emphasized a lot, right, even if they graduate students um, get uh, that TA ship um, and so forth. Um, and then there's uh, the third gap here, a slash need that I want, wanted to also address um, that this program um, um, tries to um, solve in that, you know, we're seeing that academic libraries are increasingly providing sites of services that address really many, many parts now of the research data lifecycle. And one way to do so involves delivering a suite of tech and data science centric workshops. However, you know, the lack of resources, expertise, or capacity makes it a lot of times really a challenge to offer um, training that's consistent, that um, addresses disciplinary related learning outcomes and needs. Um, just this last um, presentation by Jessica Hagman, who was talking about, um, you know, that uh, scope creep, right? So this is kind of what this slide is addressing here. Um, so for example, I, I work with the social sciences. Um, I can teach and lead sessions related to, um, you know, R and Python programming languages that's targeted towards novice learners. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest, I don't feel particularly well equipped to teach maybe more advanced sessions that are for like, for example, the bioinformatics folks, right? I mean, I technically can with preparation, thought lesson planning, but I just don't have that subject ex expertise or, or that good intuition of the common recurring hurdles of those that like, do the work of bioinformatics, for example. So, um, so enter the NFCDS uh, Pedagogy uh, Fellowship Program. So planning for this program started the summer of 2021. Uh, the planning team consisted of six librarians um, from the center, and we also have a postdoc as well, Arno Zimmern, um, who would eventually go to uh, co-facilitate this program with me. Um, as a team, we thought about um, the learning uh, and program outcomes, what that would be, what was the key takeaway that we wanted, right, the fellows to take out of the program. Um, we asked the question of who are we looking for? Um, we collectively agreed that inclusive teaching and, um, and diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility should be the central tenet to the fellowship's ethos. Um, this stems from the recognition that our cohort has this really unique opportunity to intentionally and purposefully think through and act upon inclusive teaching practices. Um, many graduate students, we noticed, were not afforded uh, the space to really unpack inclusive pedagogy as they a lot of times are, are um, focusing their attention on meeting departmental demands, um, requests, priorities. And this isn't to say that inclusive um, pedagogy is non-existent within departmental landscapes. Rather, there can be limited opportunities to actually apply these practices. Um, and whether or not a candidate has formal teaching experience in the higher education sector, um, we were asking in the application um, for um, applicants to, to demonstrate an awareness of DEIA issues in teaching and pedagogy, or provide some compelling um, action items that address um, existing barriers and that hunger to amplify marginalized voices. Um, so we were also looking for a fellows that presented a feasible plan in terms of what they wanted and were interested in teaching. Um, the plan should be feasible, realistic, ensuring that when they are done with the program that they have these meaningful accomplishments that they can show off in their CVs and dossiers. Um, the candidates proposed projects slash plans should align with the program, although we recognize that scaling and adjustment of expectations um, may be necessary, especially um, during our pilot. 
Um, so we ended up with these uh, three main goals. Um, you know, the, the fellows would learn um, through understanding, applying, analyzing, and reflecting upon these evidence-based practices and principles related to teaching, engage in um, teaching-related activities, and really um, be a member of this robust community practice and belonging in the NFCDS team, essentially. Um, so in order to effectively oversee a program that centers around pedagogy, um, we came in recognizing um, what we as the unit had to offer, and, and it was a lot we, we had to offer, but also not overlooking the fact that um, we were also um, and should be leveraging existing experts within the Notre Dame community, right, as well as in-house um, library expertise, too, that's outside of the um, NFCDS. A lot of um, uh, NFCDS uh, librarians and staff are certified carpentries instructors. Um, and if you don't know what the Carpentries are, it's a, an organi organization that teaches software engineering and data science skills to researchers through instructional workshops. And as an organization, they train and foster an active, inclusive, diverse uh, community of learners and instructors that promotes um, and models the importance of software and data research. Um, so it's this expertise and vision of the Carpentries that have guided a lot of how we at the NFCDS has led um, workshops. Um, especially those one-shot workshops. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to draw upon what, what we've learned through carpentries. Um, many of your universities um, or, or settings may have these learning slash teaching centers that develop and provide experiences, opportunities, and resources that supports the growth of faculty and graduate students in achieving excellence in teaching. And Notre Dame is no exception to that. We have amazing partners, the, the Canib Center for Teaching Excellence, who do a phenomenal job of um, offering workshops, collaborative consultations that explore a variety of pedagogical approaches with an emphasis on the creation and implementation of engaged uh, student-centered learning experiences. And we were really fortunate um, to bring on board Christy Rudenga and her two postdocs, um, Dominique Vergas and Emily Donahoe, to lead two sessions for the program. Um, one session was focused on the inner mechanics of um, designing and delivering a workshop. So thinking about brainstorming, outlining, things like Bloom's taxonomy, um, devising activities that are linked to learning outcomes, being very intentional, right? And also they led another uh, workshop that was more about the immediate aftermath of delivering a workshop, thinking about inclusive feedback forms, making a revision plan. Um, and so, and so we had carpentry as paint up center, but there's also, of course, in-house experts in the library, right? We have, um, we had a workshop on facilitating learning um, that was led by uh, the late and beloved uh, graduate outreach and research uh, services librarian, Mandy Havert. Um, we had a session on in introducing ed tech and web-based um, syllabi um, too from our um, web librarian as well. So, um, so, we, we opened up the um, application portal in late summer. Um, since uh, students were funded through this um, program through a, a stipend top off, we needed to get support slash buy-in um, from associate deans. Um, and, and the timing was a bit off, which meant that we couldn't formally open up the opportunity to the College of Engineering. Um, but nevertheless, we were able to open it up to arts and letters and sciences. Um, and it's really quite fascinating to look at uh, it was close to like a 50-50 split in terms of like, you know, where the applicants were coming from. And if we even break it down further by um, the departments we're seeing here, right, um, it's, it's pretty spread out here too. Um, so it's really quite varied, it stems from a lot of disciplines and it's showcasing that this sort of program is really addressing a, a need that's really like scattered throughout um, and not just, you know, associated with a particular college. Um, so, yeah, we ended up um, getting a cohort of five fellows, these wonderful uh, human beings. We, we got a biologist, uh, Elizabeth Brooks, sociologist, Kenya Lee, historian, historian uh, Jacob Swisher, chemist, Craig Waite, and a physicist, uh, Winona Wan. Um, and this is just a, a snapshot in the day of the life of the fellows. Um, the leads of this uh, uh, a program are, are yours truly, and also, as I mentioned earlier, Arno Zimmern, who is a postdoc in the center. Um, he, he is a, a scholar of digital humanities. Um, and a big part of the program, as I've sort of alluded to, um, is right getting the students to design, deliver, assess, and iterate workshops. 
And in the next slide, I'll highlight some of the example workshops um, that have come out of this program. Uh, we meet weekly um, for one hour um, at seminar style events that hosted in the NFCDS classrooms. Um, and given that this uh, program was uh, piloted amid our pandemic and COVID, we, we did pivot a lot between in-person, hybrid, remote, whenever necessary. And, and the importance of that flexibility um, for the sake of our community could not be um, understated as, you know, not only were the fellows um, juggling the demands of, of being a graduate student, but also the schedules that had been warped by the strains of the pandemic. Um, the diversity of the cohort, in particular, thinking about the diversity of disciplines, career stages, career goals, um, teaching experience, that's what drove the need for this weekly meeting, with the weekly meetings that would provide not only a common intellectual um, background, but a common language, um, common ambitions, common skills, and ultimately that wonderful sense of belonging. Um, there's also this um, mentorship component of the program where fellows would meet up with some uh, of the NFCDS librarians and staff. So, um, so fellows uh, maintained ownership of their individual workshops and took responsibility um, for that designing and delivering uh, one or more workshops that would, are suited towards their, their teaching interests, right? We didn't want to necessarily uh, uh, tell them what to teach. It was all driven by their interests. And, and we did get a sense of that through the application process. Um, so it, really what they taught match um, their, um, their interests, um, ranging from sessions on programming and data analysis with R and Batch, an introduction to LaTeX, um, which is especially helpful for those um, in you know, the tail end of um, composing their dissertations. Um, using JS for research and data story, storytelling or experiential programs focused on introducing learners to the physics behind the digital technologies we encounter in the world around us. Um, so fellows are, um, also pursued opportunities to deliver workshops for um, a wider range of, of audiences, including university students and faculty. Um, and Kenya Lee um, also um, is teaching for uh, high school students within the South Bend, Indiana community as well, which is pretty neat. Um, so although by, by teaching uh, workshops, fellows provided a service um, to the NFCDS and the Notre Dame community. And um, the program's emphasis on fellow control over uh, workshop development placed fellows' interests and professional development at the forefront of the uh, program's instructional component. So at the end of the day, what do fellows get after all is said and done? Um, they get a stipend top off. Um, just for context to, uh, so, so we initially had budgeted it um, for, for a step in top off of uh, $5,000 um, per um, fellow um, for a whole academic year. And we had three of them. We were, however, ended up able to support five in total because we had reached out to other colleges to see if they would be able to help pitch in. Um, and I, I spoke with some associate deans and, and one in particular uh, through uh, College of Science was really sold on the idea. So we were able to fund a two additional uh, College of Science um, um, fellows, which was awesome. Um, really, really appreciate that. Um, so, so, you know, the, the fellows get that. Um, they get that formal instructional training experience, right? Um, a unique thing about the program is that they're really given that space and time to revisit um, a workshop after you know their first rodeo, um, um, you know the first time around where they're implementing something, they get feedback, um, and then they're able to revisit it and apply, um, make changes um, based on that feedback. A lot of times, um, graduate students, you know, maybe during their graduate experience, they might be in in invited to be a guest lecturer, um, teach a workshop. But a lot of times, it's a one-time instance, so they don't a lot of times get the opportunity to revisit and take into account feedback. Um, at the end of the day, they would get um, the curriculum that they've developed that they can use in um, instances um, later on, whether that's at Notre Dame or you know, wherever um, their next chapter is. Um, we already have a fellow that is a subbing for a sociology class and that will be teaching a lesson that she developed um, related to the R program languages, uh, language uh, for the social sciences. 
Um, we also uh, partnered with um, MD Studios, um, which is a media production resource um, for the Notre Dame community, to film fellows um, delivering um, one of their spring workshops with the goal of providing um, further opportunities for fellows to reflect and, and view uh, how they teach and kind of, you know, kind of shadowing themselves in a way. Um, so yeah, and that, that um, added professional development through those guest lecturers, guest speakers, leveraging on um, the expertise of folks from Cana, for example. Um, and yeah, and what, what the fellows found to be extremely rewarding was getting to interact with folks outside of their departmental bu bubbles um, in a really meaningful way. Um, and yeah, what, what does the library get? Um, so more of workshop offerings, right? Like this in a way kind of helps address that, that scope creep um, but also, I'll get into a little later about um, the elephant in the room, though. Yeah, this does, but there still needs to be like infrastructure, the time and training and labor still involved to make this happen, right? So, um, but nevertheless, you get more workshop offerings. Uh, another opportunity for, for libraries to have that positive impact um, um, through stronger ties with departments and stakeholders, um, just by me reaching out to, uh, uh, you know, admin at, at a higher level um, and them like being sold on the idea what was really absolutely fruitful and fantastic. Um, and also the libraries, we too really learn from the fellows that they're really this inquisitive bunch who have certainly taught me a lot about situational learning and teaching and how they uh, navigate around higher education spaces and um, how graduate students, um, you know, view a library service. So we get, you know, that insider look, just, you know, me interacting with them so frequently and mentoring them and meeting them on a weekly basis. Um, so what we learned, um, libraries are certainly um, able to interact with data literacy initiatives in exciting ways while addressing graduate students' needs on something like this. Um, there are many moving parts. This is especially true when fellows have different workshop ideas in terms of the types of um, participants it attracts or thinking about how to best get the word across. And even about like the timing of when these workshops would be put on, um, this was something of a challenge because we didn't wanna treat the program where it was programmatically like tied to each semester where it would lead up to like the end of semester and then a workshop would happen because at the end of semester, right? That's when folks get really busy <laughs> with finals, with all that happening. and and. Really, no one wants to really attend a workshop then just because they're too busy. So um, we don't want that to happen um, due to uh, low attendance numbers. So we had to find a way to get like a lot of that workshop happening, at least in the, the middle of any given semester. Um, we were also um, in a position where there were limitations in terms of content expertise. I mean, the facilitators, me and Arnaud, Arnaud is more of a, a digital humanities scholar. I'm more of a, a quantitative data analysis person in the social sciences. We were, um, it, with that in mind, like I was able to give um, guidance on pedagogy, workshop um, development, um, advice. But when it came down to like the content, right, it varied. Um, like, I'm not gonna pretend that I'm a physicist, right? I'm, and I can't really advise our physicists on like how to best explain Faraday's law of induction. So, and then because of that, uh, we, we do um, open up to, to, to um, extend, you know, their network um, to folks within their departments as well. Um, so um, I do believe um, that uh, there is value and worth in fellowship programs like this, and that can be kind of, uh, kind of remixed according to your available resources and environments. The elephant in the room is that, yes, it takes time to write, supervise, train, evaluate, make functional. And I really do stress that um, at the very least, resources need to go towards compensating your graduate students, right? Don't make that labor go invisible. Um, uh, and outside of that, though, it can be pretty low cost, especially if your um, fellows are, are teaching open source um, tools and methods. Um, and what a pedagogical focused uh, fellowship at your institution can be made possible um, um, through an exciting collaboration that uh, spans across library units. Um, that, you know, just thinking about the, the uh, for example, hypothetically, think about like cataloging slash metadata librarians who wrangle with data, um, collaborating in structural coordinators, you know, these sorts of things, like this is an example of a possible um, collaborative project. Um, and also collaborating too with external stakeholders. Um, we, we shouldn't forget that. 
Um, so as I mentioned on an earlier slide, I'm not a content expert for all the things that our fellows are, are doing, but I see the library as a primary responsibility in all of this as um, an entity that fosters that community practice while also being a supportive system uh, of pedagogical endeavors and, and being open to reaching out to others on campus to fill in any gaps. Um, really the graduate students themselves, they're the experts of the content and um, we should encourage them to reach out to their networks for any additional um, support in um, that or me. So uh, the general approach is, is portable to libraries, I, you know, just from, from our pilot year, I'd say, um, and, and really identifying collaborator, collaborators um, might be key to how the program such as this could manifest um, within your given institutional context. So, um, so yeah, there, that is that. Um, so you have still five minutes remaining and I can uh, take any questions. Actually, there's like one question uh, for you. Um, and she says, this is brilliant. I'm wondering how your team settled on the 5K amount. I'm also hoping you could clarify what, whether students had to submit plans as part of the application process or did that happen after once they were selected? If they were expected to submit plans, did you have a sample for them to model? Great, great question. Thank you so much. Uh, so that 5K amount <laughs> took a lot of like back and forth, talking with administrators, um, settling on like what made like, what was the most kosher, what was the most kosher one within like the Notre Dame landscape. We ended up with 5K because it wouldn't, it wouldn't like pass a threshold with where a lot of um, students were already getting funded um, through other stipends because this is stipend top off. Um, but 5K, we were also told would, would make the program competitive as well because they were, were lower like 3K or 4K. There's other kinds of uh, fellowship programs out there within the campus. Um, so we wanted to be a little more competitive too, just by chipping in that extra 1K. So a lot of like, it's gonna depend on like how funding um, occurs um, and happens within your institutional context and driving um, and, and that like uh, culture and even like the political <laughs> side of things too um, get into play. With regards to um, the question of um, um, clarify students submit a plan, we, we asked them to just um, throw, uh, give us a sense of like what they were interested in, um, teaching, um, what motivates them to become better teachers. But we also stress in the application that you're not, you're not stuck to whatever you present, right? Um, you can change um, later on, um, um, but we just wanted to kind of get a sense of like, what is motivating you to become a better teacher is kind of um, the, the main criteria that we were looking for. So, and we also uh, stress too that uh, folks um, who might not, not might not identify as like experts in data science or digital scholarship. That's not a requirement, um, but but some um, experience, um, some um, you know application of that in past work, past research is um, a bonus. So, thank you, Ben, um, and Stacy also agrees that it was a fantastic presentation. I don't think we will have time for more questions. I mean, there may be time for questions, but you won't have time to answer them thoroughly. Uh, so people can email you if they have questions, follow up questions. Sounds good. Yep. Feel free to um, email me. Um, here's my Twitter handle and all that. So yeah, it was a um, pleasure. So thank you very much.